subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go dear students raus ias prelims test series 2021 is a complete testing and revision course for the upcoming prelims examination the program will help you prepare for upsc prelims through our step up approach it is a meticulously designed study plan to organize your preparation and keep you on track towards covering the prelims gs and csat syllabus extensively from ncert to the advanced level the goal of our prelims test series 2021 program is to exhaustively cover all standard sources of study material including ncert with a study plan to test you at par with upsc level of questions thereby improving your chances of clearing the prelims examination to give multiple revision of the entire syllabus from the perspective of civil service prelims pattern the test series program will also give you the final revision of all topics and themes before the examination through qip videos and prelims compass notes the qip videos or quality improvement program videos are for speedy revision of all important topics for the upcoming prelims examination qip videos are kind of crash course for the prelims examination and prelims compass are eight subject wise prelims compilation of all static and current affair topics important for the upcoming prelims Rao's IAS prelims test series 2021 will include topics test testing the concept of candidate it will include thematic test on both the concept and the current affair of that particular theme it will also include current affair tests covering the monthly current affairs and there will be full length test before the final exam to simulate you for the d day there is a link in the description of this video You can click on the link for registration and to also check out the demo QIP videos. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. In this session, we will have a discussion on today's newspaper, The Hindu, Delhi edition, dated 19 January 2021. We shall pick up articles important for civil service examination and discuss them as per the demand of the exam. The articles that we shall take up for discussion have been tabulated in front of you and the time stamping for the same has been given in the description section. This article is from page number 5. Maharashtra among three states with highest deaths in road accidents. We will cover this topic of road accident more holistically. See transport sector or logistics is the lifeblood of economy. It helps in the fair distribution of goods and services and also movement of people in any economy. So logistics or the transport sector is considered as an important socio-economic indicator of any economy. And the share of the sector in GDP is steadily increasing. We have seen growth of logistics sector in the last decade as 7.8%. Presently, logistics sector contribute around 14% to the GDP. But however traffic accidents are indicator of bottlenecks and hindrances in the smooth flow of traffic and within traffic accident road accident is of a special significance because indian roads carry around 85% of passengers and 80% of goods and the highway accidents assume even more significance because even though highways make only about 2% of total road but it has 55% of total road traffic this is why ncrb national crime record bureau collects data on road accident and makes a special report on it india is also a signatory to brasilia declaration which has a target to reduce road accidents by half by 2020 but obviously this target has been missed as per the report of ncrb total traffic accidents that happened in the year 2019 was around 4 lakh 70000 there has been only marginal decrement in the road accident from previous 2 years the fatality in road accident in india is very high from 2015 approximately 1.5 lakh lives are lost every year and this number has consistently increased in the year 2001 fatality was around 80000 
In India, accident death rate is quite high. It is 18.9 for every 1 lakh people. Even in country like Bangladesh, this number is 11. And the risk of road accident and the fatalities is increasing. According to the World Bank report delivering road safety in India, the high speed road infrastructure has only increased the risk of road users. So the problem of road accident is a serious one and has to be dealt comprehensively. We will do a short comprehensive analysis of problems and solutions to road accident but before that let us see provisions of amended motor vehicle act 1988 the provisions that will help in increasing road safety first of all the amendment to motor vehicle act 1988 has increased the penalty for traffic violations previously the compensation for road related accident and death were very meager the compensation for death now has been increased to rupees 2 lakh for this purpose, the amended act now has a provision for motor vehicle accident fund. The act now also provides for creation of national road safety board. This will be an advisory body to advise the central and state governments on all aspects related to road safety. In order to utilize the golden hour, which is considered to be the first 60 minutes after accident and is very crucial to reduce the fatality and recovery of the victim. The amended act has given protection to Good Samaritan. People who help the road accident victim and bring them to hospital, they will not be liable for any civil or criminal action. Usually, the police start to use investigating the Good Samaritans, the one who is helping the victim. The act now also calls for more technology in road administration. The amendment envisage automation of vehicle fitness and computerization of driving test reducing human interface that will surely reduce corruption and ensure only able people are given driving license the act also calls for setting up more training schools for specialized vehicles for giving the drivers commercial driving license for those vehicles if the vehicle becomes very old and can damage the environment the act calls for recalling such vehicle and if the fitness of vehicle is automated then this provision will be strengthened and can be done on time. Presently, we do not have a national transportation policy. The amended act calls for consultation with state government and formulating a national transportation policy. It is important for you to note that the amendment to Motor Vehicle Act talks about taxi aggregators and they are considered as digital intermediaries. These taxi aggregators will have to take license by the state government and they have to comply with the Information Technology Act. Since there have been many cases of mishap related to Ola, Uber and other taxi aggregators, so that aspect also needs to be covered vis-a-vis -vis road safety. Now let us look at the issue of road safety from the perspective of governance, GS Paper 2. See, for governance, the first and foremost thing is a vision of governance that comes from policy. In order to implement the vision of policy, we do legislation. For legislation to be implemented, there has to be strong administration. And administration requires two things. First of all, human resource, which comes from institutional capacity, development of good institutions, and infrastructure, physical infrastructure, digital infrastructure, which the administration can use along with human resources. Then there will be rules and norms and process of administration including transparency, accountability, audit and so hence and so forth. For the success of administration, we require people's participation. And as human civilization grows and progress, we see application of technology in every sphere of life. So if we are talking about road accident, we must see application of technology vis-a-vis -vis road administration as well. This is a general framework that you can apply to any topic if we are doing it under governance. Let us try and apply this template for road administration. First of all, there is a need of policy. Do we have a policy? For very long, we did not have a policy. But in 2015, we signed Brazilian declaration which required proper road administration setup to decrease the accident level to half. But immediately after signing the Brasilia declaration, we did not have a policy. But recently, we have an approved national road safety policy. Legislation. Do we have a legislation for the concerned issue? We did have a legislation and that was enacted in 1988, Motor Vehicle Act. Many of the provisions were obsolete. 
we did the amendment to this legislation in 2019. To implement the legislation for proper road administration, we need institutional capacity. And there is always human resource and budget constraint with PWD. To overcome this problem, it has been suggested by Niti Aayog that 10% of the fund that is earmarked for road infrastructure must be reserved for maintenance. It also has been ideated that vocational training courses must be started on road construction in our ITIs. That will solve the problem of budget for road maintenance and human resources. Regarding road infrastructure, it is generally known that the roads are poorly designed and poorly maintained. Only 6% of our total roads are highways and only 22% of highways are 4 lane or above. So in this regard, continuous road infrastructure improvement is required and the important projects like Bharat Mala Pariyojana, these has to be completed on time and then maintenance also has to be done. The Central Road and Infrastructure Fund, which was previously Central Road Fund, now this fund operates under Ministry of Finance. This must be used for maintenance of roads. Once you have the human resource and you have the desired infrastructure, then it requires administrative competence. For example, there must be accountability of contractors. There must be stringent testing of driving skills. There must be institutional coordination. For example, transport data center must be set up at national level. Presently, the data regarding accidents is collected by NCRB. The amended Motor Vehicle Act provided for National Safety Board. This has not been operationalized yet. At the earliest, this must be made operational. Ministry of Road, Transport and Highway has come up with application where people can report black spots. That portion of the road that is prone to high accidents. There must be high administrative response towards reporting from people for such black spots. The traffic management system in India is very poor. Many a times you will see the red light not working, the camera is not working, the speedometers on highway is not working. A better IT enabled traffic management system must be put in place. However, road administration cannot be made effective without people's participation. There must be awareness drive regarding road safety. Maharashtra, for instance, is conducting road safety awareness this week. People should be sensitized regarding creation of unauthorized speed breakers near their homes. Since there are no signboards for that, many a time they become reason for road accidents. People must be sensitized for using helmets, for not over speeding, especially on highways. And in any area of governance, you must look at the possibility of application of technology. Niti Aayog has recommended that 1% of the fund for road infrastructure must be earmarked for R&D purpose, which will help in coming up with more improved material that will help in creating durable roads. For instance, use of plastics have been started to make it waterproof and durable. New technologies are coming in that alerts the driver if they fall asleep while driving. Possibility of making such technologies applicable as far as possible or even compulsory must be looked into. Who will look into all these things? Unless you have National Safety Board operationalized, these safety measures cannot be institutionalized. This is the general template for covering any topic regarding governance. You can use this template for other topics as well. This is a lead article from page number 6. The article is based on much needed prison reform. Prison reform, its need was felt more during the COVID-19 pandemic because it was observed many of the prisons were becoming hot spots for COVID-19. Overcrowding, especially we will talk in context of India, is one of the structural problems of Indian prison, apart from understaffing and underfunding. COVID-19 pandemic has only re-highlighted the long-standing problem of Indian prison reform. There are many issues related with this and we'll try and cover this holistically in this discussion. To begin with, Indian prison accommodate 4.8 lakh prisoners. This data is of 2019. But as second ARC report observed back in 2005, when the number was 4.2 lakh, that India houses less number of prisoners as compared to other countries like USA and China, both in absolute terms and also as percentage of entire population. The absolute number or the percentage of population wise, the number is less. But when looked in terms of prison capacity, till there is overcrowding. The occupancy rate in Indian prison is 115%. 
Although this has come down from 140% in 2007, but still there is overcrowding because of high occupancy rate. There is a perennial problem of shortage of prison staff. This shortage of human resource concerning prison administration is a huge problem. Due to this, physical production of accused for a trial in a court is much hindered. And that coupled with understaffing in judiciary itself creates huge problem of high number of under trials. Almost 68% of prisoners in India are under trials, meaning they have been accused, they are serving the jail term, but they have not been convicted yet. It is very likely that they will be set free by the court. So the trial, the punishment in prison that they are serving is injustice to them. Indian prison also has not been able to adopt a reformative approach. The condition is very inhumane. The number of unnatural deaths, the number of suicide in Indian prison has increased year on year. All these can be seen as weakness in prison administration. And it must be seen in the context of shortage of prison staff and especially lack of welfare officer and dedicated law officer for every prison. As per the Prison Act 1894 and the Prisoner Act 1900, there should be a welfare officer and a law officer in every jail. However, in most jails, they have not been appointed. Government of India has taken many steps with regard to prison reform. Some of them have been given here, we'll discuss, and then we'll discuss as to what more can be done. First of all, in 2005, CRPC was amended to add Section 436A, according to which, excluding offences for which capital punishment is envisaged, under trials can be released on a personal bond with or without security. If the period spent in detention by under trials has been more than half of the maximum period of imprisonment that they will get if convicted. Meaning, for example, if the crime they have been accused of has a maximum prison period of 7 years. So if they have already spent 3.5 years in jail, then on a personal bond with some security of some amount or even without that, they can be released. It will help in decongestion of the prison and avoid situations like hotspots during some pandemic. And more importantly, it will introduce the principle of fairness in India's legal jurisprudence. A new prison manual 2016 was introduced by the central government to bring uniformity in laws, rules and regulations governing Indian prison. But because of understaffing, this has not been implemented properly. There is also a modernization of prison scheme to improve the living condition in prison. It was introduced back in 2002 and 3. But because of budgetary constraint, the performance of the scheme has been very limited. Digitization has been attempted in the prison management system through e-prison project, but it has not been completed yet. Proper prison management system and interconnectivity of all the prisons so that a central repository of data is developed that has not been done in India yet. It is important to take more measures in prison reform to not just bring justice to one of the most vulnerable section, the prisoners, the under trials, but to also achieve the goals set by Indian constitution and to make our democracy more functional. Article 39A of Indian constitution directs the state to ensure that operation of the legal system promotes justice. In particular, it directs the state to provide legal aid by suitable legislation or scheme to ensure that opportunities for securing justice is not denied to citizens due to economic or any other disability. But the data shows that most of the under trials and the prisoners are from socio-economic backward classes. Also, right to free legal aid is seen as an essential right guaranteed by constitution. It forms the basis of reasonable, fair and just liberty under Article 21. So not only from governance perspective, but for the success of Indian polity and democracy, we must take up prison reform. Now, if you have to suggest measures for prison reform, how would you go about? In the preceding article, I have discussed with you a template. I told you, if you want to discuss any topic on governance, you can follow this template. First of all, there has to be a policy that will have vision and targets. In order to implement those visions and targets, there must be legislation. For legislation to be implemented, there has to be an administrative setup. Administrative setup will require institutions, human resources and infrastructure. 
then there will be certain rules, principles, theories of administration that must be made functional. For larger success of process of governance, there has to be people's participation and you have to see ways and means in which technology can come in aid for governance. Beginning with policy, there is no policy, no set target for prison reform. For example, from 2016 to 18, prison population in India increased by 8.2%. And the sanctioned strength for Indian prison increased only by 0.7%. Sanctioned strength was easy to be trespassed because there is no set target of occupancy rate of Indian prison. Concerning legislation, we have seen before that Section 436A has been added in the CRPC. But we do not have a dedicated legislation for welfare of inmates. We have legislation for old age people, we have legislation for women, we have legislation for differently abled people, we have several legislation for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, we have guidelines for the welfare of particularly vulnerable tribal groups, we have welfare measures for minorities, but there is no dedicated legislation or proper guidelines for welfare of inmates to look into issue of depression, to look into the issue of suicides. So that must be set first before we can see any success in the governance process of prison administration. Then for administration, you have to build institutions. Just like we talked about road safety board, similarly, there must be a national prison commission. The government must ensure presence of a dedicated law officer and welfare officer for every prison. Capacity building of prison staff, their training is extremely important if you have to take measures like skill development of the prisoners. If you have to train them, if you want to ensure that once they leave the prison, they go with some financial security. They have some earning within the prison. Capacity building of prison staff is also very crucial with regard to juveniles. You must ensure that juveniles are not clubbed together with hardened criminals. Juveniles must be treated differently because chances of reformation in case of juveniles is higher. Similarly, you also require infrastructure building, for example, special codes must be built for pity crimes. Because the punishment for pity crimes are less and it has been observed that many a times under trials spend more term than otherwise would have been given for the crime that they have committed. Unified prison management system must be developed so that there is a repository of data at one place. The criminal records, the court orders, everything can be accessed from one place. Like any other reform, prison reform can also not be successful when people are not participating. The social community must accept the convicts after they have been released. They must become part of society easily, they must get integrated otherwise. They will have feeling of injustice still continued and all the effort that you have put within the prison is not going to work because even after being released from prison, they will be pushed to the edge, encouraging them to do criminal actions again. Use of ICT like video conferencing for trial will help in ensuring that the trials are conducted on time and the problem of getting the accused traveling all the way to the court that can be easily overcome. You can add more points in this structure. You can use the recommendation of Amitabh Roy committee that was set up by Supreme Court for prison reform. Most of the recommendation as such I have used here, but you can use the name of the committee to add value. This will give you structure and enrichment you can keep on doing. This news article is from page number one. Only police should decide on tractor rally, says Supreme Court. Supreme Court, while hearing a petition filed by the center against the tractor rally that is to be organized by the farmer union on Republic Day, said that the issue of tractor rally essentially is a matter of law and order. And Delhi police is the most appropriate authority to decide on the matter. Concerning the issue of tractor rally, there are arguments on both sides. The farmer union is asserting that it is their constitutional right of dissent and to protest peacefully. However, government of India wanted Supreme Court to pass an order restraining farmers from holding such a rally. The argument is that it would disrupt the Republic Day celebration in Delhi and the right to express dissent cannot be at the cost of maligning the nation's image globally. Based on these contrasting arguments, Supreme Court extraordinarily showed judicial restraint. Generally, Supreme Court is proactive in admitting the cases of national importance and related to fundamental rights of citizen. But this time around, Supreme Court has chosen to show judicial restraint, did not pass any order, 
did not give permission, did not stop the tractor rally, rather asked the Delhi police and the Union of India to use their appropriate powers and decide on the issue. This judicial restraint showed by the Supreme Court is important for GS Paper 2, for the topic of separation of powers between various organs. Judicial activism has been covered in the DNS previously, and judicial activism is something that you hear more often than judicial restraint. But many a times we see instances of judicial restraint as well. Judicial restraint is a theory in the legal jurisprudence that encourages judges to limit the exercise of their own power. It encourages judges to have a rethink, maybe to hesitate to strike down the laws, unless they are obviously against the constitution. Lawmaking is the job of the legislator and deciding on their constitutional validity is the job of judiciary. Under the practice of judicial restraint, judiciary looks into the legislative intent rather than the nitty-gritty and the exact provision of the legislation. As the phrase itself suggests, in judicial restraint, more restraint is exercised by the judges, less of innovation, less of wide open interpretation. The original intent of the writers of the constitution is looked into. In judicial activism, more liberal interpretation of the constitution is done. The interpretation that is not found in the intention of the constitution makers. The judges take the interpretation so liberally that it goes far away from the original intent of the constitution framers. Like Supreme Court of India has done to many articles, especially Article 21. In judicial restraint, judges look for precedent rather than liberal interpretation and innovation. Judicial restraint is very important in preserving the balance of power. But it works best when all the branches of the government, judiciary, executive and legislature are working perfectly fine. If the executive and legislature are abdicating their responsibility, then a vacuum is created for judiciary to fill and that give rise to judicial activism. For example, if legislature and executive are not giving enough attention to rights of the citizens, to environment, then in that case, judiciary start to take up the job. For example, MC Mehta case regarding BS4 vehicles. Supreme Court framed Vishakha guidelines. Those were the job of executive and legislature. If executive and legislature are proactive, there is no need of judicial activism. Judicial restraint is best to be followed then. Because judges neither have the expertise nor the resource to solve major problem in the society and additionally, if judges start to impinge into the domain of executive and legislature, it is bound to have a strong reaction from politicians as well. And then problems will start arising concerning the appointment of judges, corrupt practices and more. All in all, balance of power will be disturbed if one organ start to impinge into the domain of other. On the other hand, if executive and legislature are not doing up their job, it is in the best interest of the citizens for judiciary to be proactive. You must have a long list of examples of judicial activism. But for exam, you must also have some examples on your tips regarding judicial restraint. Huge controversy was created regarding Aadhaar bill being passed as money bill. But Supreme Court did not indulge into the constitutionality of passing Aadhaar bill as money bill because Supreme Court looked at the intent of the legislation. As we have seen here, legislative intent is to be looked upon in practice of judicial restraint and not into the nitty-gritty and the specific provision of the law. Supreme Court also showed restraint on the issue of Article 370 did not pass any judgment regarding center abrogating this article. Supreme Court also showed extraordinary restraint in cancellation of Rafale deal. And recently, Supreme Court has refrained from giving any orders to stall the Central Vista project. Now we have come to the end of the session. The answer to yesterday's question of the day and today's question of the day is on your screen. Please read it out, attempt it, post your answer and attempt the DNS quiz on our eLearn platform. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Take care.